Hello and welcome to OpWall's Field Notes, a podcast created by Operation Wallacea to share stories and insights from our 25 years working in the field. My name is Sophia Wood, OpWall's Country Manager for Ecuador and Director of Friends of Wallacea, and I will be your host for this series. We launched this podcast to shine a light on the world of biodiversity field research and the work of those who dedicate their lives to understanding and protecting our planet. Each month, we have conversations with scientists, community conservationists, and experienced academics about new research, protecting biodiversity, and daily life out in the field. Gara Trujillo is a passionate conservation biologist from Spain by way of Venezuela, who was the Opwa Galapagos site manager in 2019. She recently completed an Erasmus master's program in environmental sciences, policy, and management while traveling across Greece, Hungary, and Sweden. As an ecologist, Gara has worked in the Amazon rainforest in Peru, in coastal Greece, and in the Galapagos Islands with Opwal. This episode was recorded in early 2021, when she was still completing her master's program. However, Gara is now interning at WWF Sweden. In this joint episode, you'll also hear Gara interview me about our site in the Ecuadorian Amazon and how it has evolved since I started managing the project in 2018. For those of you who don't know, I got my start at Operation Wallacea in 2017 while helping set up the Fiji project just a few days after graduating from university. After a brief stint in venture capital and startups in Latin America, I dove into conservation full-time with Opwal in 2019 to run Friends of Wallacea, our tourism arm, and continue developing conservation projects alongside indigenous communities across the region. I hope you enjoy this special episode learning about our conservation in the Galapagos and the Ecuadorian Amazon. Well, welcome to another episode of Opwal's Field Notes. Today, we actually have a little bit of a different format because I run our Ecuador site and wanted to get a chance to talk a bit about the research that we're doing at the site. So I brought in a special guest from our Galapagos site to interview me, but I'll actually start by interviewing her so you get a bit of background on her and what she's been doing and, of course, the exciting things going on at the Galapagos site in Ecuador. So you get a two for one in this episode and enjoy. Thanks so much for joining us today, Gara. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so since we're taping everything from home, where are you based right now? Um, so I am actually in Malmo, which is in the south of Sweden, and it's about an hour from Copenhagen. Awesome. Well, so I don't so you don't have to ask me later. I'm in Mexico City. So you're in Malmo nearing the end of a really cool master's program, which you actually started right after the 2019 field season. Could you tell us a bit about how your program works and what you're studying? Yeah, so I started my master's right after my um, Galapagos season in 2019. And it's a program called Masters in Environmental Sciences, Policy and Management. So after, I think, some experiences in the field, I decided that I wanted to kind of head more into the social side of science. And... At the moment, I'm kind of working on my thesis, which is on sustainability influencers in social media, which is very different to what I have done so far, but super interesting and exciting. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I'm doing now. And through your program, you've been in a few different countries, right? Yes. So I started in uh, Budapest in Hungary, and then I was supposed to go to Greece for my second semester uh but then COVID happened (laughs) so I couldn't do that um but I've I've been lucky enough that I could come to Sweden to do the last part of it so it's a program that it's through Erasmus so each term you get to do in a different place which is pretty cool yeah yeah I remember you telling me about that and thinking that that was a really unique program so super exciting and congratulations on being so close to finishing Well, to go into kind of the meat of obviously what we wanted to talk about, you ran our Galapagos site on Santa Cruz Island in 2019. For listeners, the Galapagos portion of the Ecuador project is educational only. So we don't do any research there because it's a really protected area. Could you paint us a quick picture of where we work in the Galapagos and also what it's like to live on these islands that are so famous? (laughs) Yeah, so um, the site in the Galapagos is based on Santa Cruz, which is sort of the most uh, populated or developed of the islands. 
And when we work there, we divide the time in two parts. The first part is spent in the Highlands View campsite, which is, um, as the name says, in the Highlands. <laughs> and there is where we do sort of the biodiversity walks and the geology walks. And then the second part of the trip, we go to Puerto Ayora, which is the sort of biggest city in Galapagos, if, if you can call it a city. <laughs> Um, and that's where the marine activities take place because it's right next to the ocean. And that's also where we get to do the really fun um, part that everybody looks forward to, which is visit the Darwin Center. And I think life in the Galapagos, I was thinking about this, and I think it's kind of like being in a safari because you're constantly surrounded by animals and they're so close to you. And I mean, they are so shy less that yeah, it's it's a really unique experience, um, but also the people are amazing and super friendly and most people speak English um, because of the uh, international reputation of the place. So yeah, it, it's a great place. Yeah, it's incredibly beautiful. And obviously when you're first walking down the street of Puerto Ayora and you run across a marine iguana and a blue-footed booby and a sea lion within a block, it's uh, quite weird. Um, very yes. <laughs> unusual experience. So what, you know, before getting into some of the activities that you, you quickly talked about, what's the difference between the highlands and the coast? Like what's, what, what's the environment like in those areas? Yeah, so the environment actually changes a lot. Um, in the highlands, it's more, it, it's surprisingly, it usually gets colder and it's more sort of humid. So you could say that it has a touch reminding you to the um, rainforest feel, maybe. Um, whereas then Puerto Ayora, which is at sea level, it's very usually warm and more sunny and so on. So it, it's it's quite a change to see both sides. Um, and I think the fact that they have such different climates or microclimates allows for very different activities. So like I said, in the highlands, we do the biodiversity walk, um, which is when you get to have a feel of what the local flora is like and the local fauna. And then um, we also do the geology walk, which is a really, I think it, it's kind of my favorite part of it because I think it's a part that people often don't think about from the Galapagos because it, because it involves the creation of the archipelago rather than just the animals that we can see there. And then, yeah, whereas in Puerto Ayora, you're doing more in-water activities like diving, snorkeling, um, the kayaking. So yeah, it's, it's quite different. Yeah, so you touched on the, um, you know, the geology of the islands. So I was gonna ask you, you know, what did you learn while working on the Galapagos that you might not have seen as just a regular tourist? Or did you have any favorite activities? Um, yeah, so I would say my favorite activity um, was the geology walk, which is often not people's favorite activity because, you know, people come to the Galapagos to see the the turtles, well, tortoises and, and the blue-footed boobies and the sea lions, but actually... I think the really interesting part of looking at the geology of the island is that it kind of brings it all together. When you understand the geological history of the place, then you get a better understanding of why we have the biodiversity that we have there, why things have evolved the way they have. And it gives you a kind of a deeper understanding of things. And I think I think that's why I liked the geology part the most because I got to talk about that with students and with, um, yeah, with the people that came. The geology walk, you go through this kilometer long lava tunnel, yes. Um, yes. which is amazing to think about. And I remember, you know, you know a lot about the geology of the islands now that you got to lead that walk. How is a lava tunnel formed really quickly? Like, what is that? Um, basically, when you have, um, how do I explain this without showing you with my hands, it's really complicated, but basically the outer parts, so when you have an eruption or volcanic activity happening, this is obviously a long time ago, 
Um, the outer parts of the lava, they dry quicker because they are in contact with the air. And so you get like a tunnel, the outside has dried already, but the inside, because it's still so hot, it's still flowing. And then maybe it stops flowing and then you get like a, yeah, an, an empty tunnel basically. And and as you said, the, the ones that we visit are over a kilometer long, which is pretty amazing. Um, you obviously need your head torches and it really feels like you're, you know, deep underground in like a National Geographic, I don't know, adventure. <laughs> But yeah, it it's, is, it's yeah, it is incredibly cool for anybody who's heading out to the Galapagos someday, um, which kind of brings me to my last big question about the Galapagos, which is, you know, the Galapagos Islands off the coast of Ecuador uh, are a bit of a dream destination for lots of adventure travelers and biologists, given the connection to Charles Darwin and, of course, the animals and the geology and what it, just what it is like to be there. So. What do you wish people knew before traveling to the Galapagos? And do you have any advice for people who are looking to visit as someone who's now lived there? Mm -hmm. um, I would say I have maybe two answers for that question, because if you are coming with the Opwell expeditions, then I would say that during our evening lectures, we cover most of the basics that you should know about the Galapagos. And so I wouldn't say that there's necessarily anything that you should be, you know, reading a lot into because you we will go through it anyway. But um, for someone who maybe wasn't part of the expeditions, then I would, I think I would continue with the geology part because I think everybody already knows a lot about the sort of flora and fauna and you know there's a lot of information about that aspect of things but I think again if you can create that link between the geological history and the biodiversity then I think that's when you've truly understood what the islands are about and so yeah I think that that would be my recommendation. Awesome so everyone should go check out the lava tunnel on Santa Cruz yes. Island it sounds like um, and I, I will get a bit of into your background before you worked with us when we get into this part next section where we'll talk a little bit about the rainforest because I know you know you you worked in the rainforest before ending up on the Galapagos. So I want to switch over quickly to some of the work that we've been doing in the Sani Reserve since this is actually where the meat of the research for Ecuador is taking place. Um, so actually we've just done the Ecuador expedition in reverse. Usually people head into the rainforest first, and now we'll be going into the rainforest second. So I'll actually turn it over to Gara to be asking me the questions mm -hmm. and talk a little bit more about Sani. Yes, great. All right. So finally, I get to ask some questions. <laughs> um, so before we talk about anything about the Ecuador side, I just wanted to uh, get a little bit of a rundown about your background and you know, how you first got involved with Opwell and ended up going to Fiji and then back to Latin America. And, you know, it's a bit all over. So if you could give a brief introduction, that would be great. Yeah, of course. My background is definitely a little bit all over. I'll try to make it not too long of a story. Um, I actually focused on African studies while I was in university and was really interested in economic development, especially through uh, sustainable tourism and ended up writing my uh, dissertation about uh, indigenous sustainable tourism or community-based tourism in Chile and in Kenya. So I was comparing the two regions where I had the most experience. And after that work, I really wanted to get back to Latin America. I studied abroad in Chile and I was really passionate about the region, speak Spanish and actually applied to work at the Ecuador site first. It was really my dream site, um, which kind of gives a bit of background on why I'm so passionate and feel so lucky to be working for this site today. At the time, I actually ended up, you know, getting an email back and, and asked, getting asked if I wanted to go out to the Fiji site um, for the first year. And I said, yes, I was just graduating from university. And it seemed like an amazing opportunity to get involved in a company that I thought seemed, you know, so aligned with what I was interested in. And getting the opportunity to work at the Fiji site in its first year really was like a um, a trial by fire introduction to Opwal. Um, there were a lot of things to work on. It was a really, really new site. I was based in the village, never had homestays before. Um, I got to learn to dive. 
And really I credit Opwal with bringing me over to the conservation side because I was always there. I've, I've always been a social scientist, always wanted to work in economic development. And then I realized over the course of writing my thesis and working with Opwal and Fiji that, you know, the conservation and economic development, especially when talking about indigenous communities were completely inextricable. And that's when I became really, really passionate about conservation and wanted to work in this. So, um, you know, six to nine months later, I, I did a bunch of other things. I was in venture capital and had my own startup and was living in Latin America when Opal reached back out about six months after my time in Fiji to ask, ask me if I would be willing to take over the Ecuador site. That was a hard yes. Um, there, like a very easy yes, I guess, a hard yes, meaning like there was no question about how important this site was to me and how excited I was to get there. And I'd like dreamed of being in the Amazon rainforest my whole life. So I was super, super excited. And really, it's been kind of a journey from there to get to work full time for Opal now starting the beginning of 2020 uh, with Friends of Walsia. And um, I'm, yeah, I'm so lucky to be able to be at the Ecuador site every year. Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you for that. And can you now tell us a bit more about the Ecuador site itself? I don't know, like how long has it been around and what are the main research questions that you focus on? Yeah, of course. So the Sunny Isla Reserve uh, Rainforest site is where we do the majority of our research or all of our research for the Ecuador program. The Ecuador program is one of the youngest and smallest sites that Opwal has. So obviously Fiji is a bit younger, but Ecuador is only five years old and we have a relatively small campsite, uh, very, very deep in the Amazon rainforest. So to give you a quick picture of what it takes to get there, you start in Quito, you take a bus for seven hours up and over and down the other side of the Andes deep into the forest. Uh, get off at a small town called Coca, which is kind of your last stop off before the depths of the Ecuadorian Amazon. It's also an oil boom town, and it's really a very, stra very strange place. And you hop on a motorized canoe and start to head down the Napo River, which is this super wide brown river. It's the biggest tributary to the Amazon. And as you're going, you start to see uh, oil barges and oil flares and just like very heavy influence of oil destruction along the Napo. And after about an hour and a half, maybe two, you break out into the clean forest. And this is where you start to hit the eco lodges. Uh, there are four eco lodges across this area and they basically are the major barrier stopping oil uh, development from moving further down the Napo River towards the border with Peru. Um, so you can actually look at a map of deforestation from Coca and you can see it like splintering towards where we work um, and really the eco lodges, including Sani Lodge, stop that. So Sani Lodge is our main partner in the Amazon and it is an eco lodge run by an indigenous community called Sani Isla, which is a Quechua speaking community with 800 people who decided about 20 years ago that they wanted to protect the forest and find a way of making income without destroying their forest, uh, without having to sell to oil and they developed this eco lodge uh, along a, in a blackwater lagoon called Chayuacocha. And we have a campsite along the Chayuacocha lagoon, but about an hour and a half rowing with a, your hands in a canoe uh, upstream all the way to our campsite in the middle of the forest. And the reason, so Sani is extremely strict about protecting this area and, you know, they require you to use hand rowed canoes in the lagoon because we have populations of giant otters, arapaima, anacondas, black caiman, like all these species that are um, generally on the IUCN red list and especially some of them like the giant otters are critically endangered in Ecuador. So we really want to protect them. So to finally get to the main research questions, one of our major goals at the Ecuador site is really to help the Sani Isla um, have a competitive advantage of the, at, at Sani Lodge and become a stronger lodge and be able to bring in more tourists and, and more income um, for tourism so that there's really no question and, and about whether or not they can continue the operation because the lodge really is the bastion against deforestation for oil. The oil companies are a massive presence in the region and it's extremely understandable why the communities along this area would be tempted or easily convinced to be able to sell their land or lease their land for oil because there's really no access to services in this area, very little internet, no roads, no hospitals. 
um, minimal schooling. So, you know, a company coming in and offering a lot of jobs is, it's difficult to, to fight. Um, and so our main goal is to fight that. And so our research revolves around species and projects that can help Sani uh, improve their tourism offering and grow the business. It operates at a really minimum level today. And even if you doubled it or tripled, it wouldn't injure wildlife at all. That's part of what we've been able to see. Um, so a lot of our work revolves around, for example, starting to habituate and track primate behavior so that people can see more monkeys, uh, trying to get a full list of all the bird species that are in the reserve, because obviously it's a huge site for birders, trying to create the first ever guide to all the herpetofauna in the reserve. Um, we created the first butterfly book for the area with over, we found hundred, more than a hundred species in our first season doing butterflies. So we're focused on species that are gonna be charismatic and attractive for tourists, but we've also, of course, focused on things that are important for biodiversity and have managed to map out a great deal of the, the mammals, the big mammals in the, the forest. I guess the final thing I'll say is like, we know for a fact that there's at least nine individual jaguars living in this area. Sani Isla protects 40,000 hectares or more using the lodge income. So uh, it's a massive impact for a, a very small amount of income coming into this lodge. And now that you were talking about the Sani Isla community, can you tell us a bit more about how Opwell has partnered with them and how you are helping to support their tourism and conservation efforts? But also, how does scientific research fit into that? Yeah, of course. And actually, funnily enough, you know, that first job that I applied for to work with Opwell was the first uh, efforts that Opwell was making to connect close, you know, make a closer partnership with the Sani Isla community around helping develop the tourism uh, offerings. And the the Sani Isla have more than one tourism project, actually. So the main one is Sani Lodge, but another one is this amazing women's cooperative called Sani Warmi. And Sani Warmi is a group of 28 women. Um, they split up into four groups of seven so that they each work a week on and three weeks off um, because they all have you know, seven to 10 kids at home, almost all of them. And it's amazing that they have managed to create this nonetheless. And they said this beautiful area where they have artwork and coffee and chocolate and they lead tours and they actually breed um, river turtles because they also have a similar problem as sea turtles. So they help river turtles make it to adulthood and then release them in the river. Um, and we partnered with Sunny Warmi specifically bringing out every single year an anthropologist to meet with them frequently, figure out what the problems are and figure out how our students and our work can support them more directly because the work that they're doing is incredible and they have very few resources to really be able to grow their business. So one of the things that we first did uh, in 2018, the first year that I was working on the site was to partner with them and with our guides to create a medicinal garden that would showcase all of the incredible herbal medicines that this community knows about and uses in their daily lives. And over the course of the whole season, we were able to identify more than 19 different species of uh, forest medicine that these women were using and actually bring out saplings and small examples and make a garden um, that is now a part of their tour so that they have more to offer and more to show of how they actually use the forest. And um, that was a great project to do in partnership with Opwell, of course, because we got to put the scientific names and start to understand the scientific value of these plants. But also, of course, um, you know, the traditional indigenous names and value of these plants. So our goal is always to figure out ways that our work can help advance what Sani is doing. And we bring out we, we do bring out an anthropologist every single year to work with them. How scientific research fits into this, I think there's a lot of different ways. The one big one that's kind of obvious and is a bit of a longer shot, but is, is you know, something that makes a, can make a huge difference for a community like this is you know, discovering or just knowing that there are IUCN red list species there, um, knowing that there are species that can't be found in other areas of Ecuador. We're immediately across the river from Yasuni National Park, which is usually considered one of the top one or two most biodiverse areas in the world. Um, and Yasuni National Park has oil drilling in it. It has oil drilling in the middle of it. Um, you can look up the Yasuni ITT initiative if you want to learn more about that. But this is an ecosystem that is under incredible threat and pressure from mining and oil. 
and logging and agriculture and all of the above. And the more that we can prove that there are species that Sani is protecting that are critical to Ecuador's rainforest ecosystem or the, the Amazon rainforest ecosystem as a whole, the more we're able to leverage funds, for example, from grants, um, you know, you massive grant organizations are super interested in protecting areas like this and helping indigenous communities that are doing this. So, but we can't ask for those grants unless we know that those species are there. So the simple fact of just being there and being able to say that there are these incredibly, you know, critically endangered elusive species living there is really helpful to us. So I think that's the big one, but when it comes down to smaller ones, you know, having scientific research at a site and, and working, you know, Sani Lodge also works with friends of Wallacea to develop um, some of their tourist products is, is really compelling to tourists today. You know, there are tourists who are looking to hopefully leave a positive impact everywhere they travel. Um, and there's really no better way of leaving a positive impact than traveling with an indigenous community that uses 100% of that income to protect their forests and educate their kids and, you know, build hospitals and do all these community development projects. Um, and getting the chance to participate in some of the scientific research that makes protecting that forest possible. So going out and camera trapping, going out and, you know, seeing monkeys, but knowing that when you saw the monkeys, that data is going to then go into, you know, the GPS and it's going onto our data sheet and it's going to be analyzed by opal scientists, even if it's not the opal season. Um, and that then that can go into a data set that helps us say, you know, there's 12 families of woolly monkeys here and woolly monkeys are endangered in this area. So we need to bring in more funding. Like your every tourist visit can help. And that's really, that's something that, you know, the scientific research aspect has a unique bonus for how we can support and help Sani Lodge. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. Thank you for that insight. And now onto my favorite question, I think, um, which is what is it actually like to live in a campsite in the middle of the Amazon rainforest for a quarter of the year? And do you have any sort of tips for travelers looking to explore that part of the world? Yeah, I think it's my quest, my favorite question as well. I mean, I spend the whole year looking forward to going into the Amazon um, with Opwald to work with Sunny, and I, I've missed it dearly over the last year. I'd say living in the Amazon is, um, I guess, not surprisingly difficult, but it can take some adjustment, especially if you're not living in a fancy eco lodge like Sunny Lodge, but actually living in your own little one person tent. Uh, in the middle of the forest. Luckily, we have um, some little like cabanas that that cover like roofs uh, and raised platforms so that we don't get wet and we're not against the, the wet ground when it rains. Um, trying to think of what the biggest adjustment was. Um, I think there's a few things that you kind of automatically start to shift on, or at least I automatically start to shift on when I arrive there, um, which is a sense, you know, your sense of time and your connection to the outside world. So for me, I generally, for some reason now, you know, after having worked for Apple for so many years, my brain kind of goes, yeah, the year goes uh, January, June, September. And until, the, you know, in between then the world just stops and I'm in a totally different world because where we are in our campsite has uh, no internet and no cell signal. You have to get all the way out to Sani Lodge to be able to get internet, which I do about once a week just to check in. Um, but besides that, you know, there's really no inner, I have no connection to the outside world for the entire week. And what I love the most about that is it forces you to slow down. So I love the rhythms of the rainforest. Um, I was talking about this the other day. I think some people get this from the ocean and some people get it from the rainforest, but you cannot decide the pace of life in the rainforest. And that's something that we don't, we're not used to anymore where, you know, we live in cities where you decide if you want to go fast, you go fast. If you want to go slow, you go slow. And, you know, you decide when you want to go and when you don't, and when you want to participate in activities and not here, that's not really how it works. If you had a plan to go birding at five in the morning, it is very frequent that I'll hear my alarm and then immediately hear <laughs> of like just torrential rainfall. And I'm like, oh, okay, I guess we're flipping back over and going back to sleep because what bird am I gonna see now? So, you know, that happens all the time. 
And I love watching, you know, one of the things I love the most about this timing is I love watching our guides drying their clothes because they wash their clothes in the, in the river and they wash all their, they're like wearing jeans and they're just so clean. And we all look like a big muddy mess all the time. And they'll wash their clothes and like, they managed to have dry jeans in the Amazon rainforest. And it's because they watch the sunlight and the second the cloud comes over, they all run out and pull all their jeans and towels off the clothes lines and run into their tents and put them away and then just torrential rainfall. And you know, 20 minutes later it stops and the sun comes back out and they all run back out and throw all their jeans back onto the, the clothes line. So the, these kinds of little timing things that you don't pay attention to because you have your face in your phone um, and there's just so many other distractions, I think are such a beautiful part. Um, and the last thing I'll say about like living in the Amazon is the people are incredible. Not, and, and you know, the local communities are incredibly welcoming and incredibly knowledgeable. I think what I'll, my main tip for travelers looking to, to travel in the Amazon is be humble and be willing to learn, like give up your ego right before you step in because you will step in a big pile of mud and fall on your face and be completely muddy from head to toe, or, you know, a bird will poop on you, or like, it'll pour rain and your shirt will be see-through. Like there's really, the, you, and, and you know, and you also have to know that you'll be 10 times muddier than your guide and they will laugh at you. That's just how it works. And that's, you know, knowing that, I think the beautiful thing about the rainforest is it shows you that you actually don't know everything and you actually know very little. Um, and that these communities that so many people, unfortunately, you know, look down on are so much more knowledgeable than we are about things that we don't even know exist. And, you know, if you compare your ability to, you know, survive in the rainforest to these local communities, it's just, you know, there's really nothing more to think about. Um, and of course, the team that we get to work with, the international scientists that come out every single year are absolutely amazing. But I, I, I really, my main advice to people is be humble, you know, give, leave your ego at the edge of the rainforest and just let it kind of absorb you and, and see what happens. Yeah, I think I can completely <laughs> empathize with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, the last question that we had was, um, so you have now been working for a really long time in tourism and specifically in indigenous community led tourism. And now you are also working with the Friends of Wallacea, which is kind of the Opal's tourism arm. How do you think that travelers can really ensure to leave a positive impact when they are traveling? That's a great question. And I talk about this all the time, obviously. And to me, really, there's like one major way of making sure that you leave a positive impact when you're traveling. And it's to make sure that the operator that you're traveling with is based in the country that you're visiting. Um, I think that's, you know, one of the number one things. And actually, one of the great things I've seen in COVID and given me a bit of hope for when we reopen is people starting to have a lot more conscience about buying from local businesses and buying from small businesses and knowing that the, what the impact of that is compared to buying from your like local Walmart or Target or big box store that you're used to that's maybe more convenient and cheaper, but isn't gonna have really a good local impact or positive local impact at all on your community. The same is the case when you travel. And it's very different to travel with, you know, a massive international company that's gonna, siphon 90% of that income back to, um, you know, the US or the UK or wherever you're traveling from, uh, versus, you know, doing some research and finding an organization on the ground. And they may well have international partners, you need to make sure that they're international partners that are bringing you to them, give them most of the income, which Friends of Alsea does. But these communities, you know, communities or local operators that also are dedicated to, uh, you know, nature based tourism and positive wildlife tourism, so by positive wildlife tourism, I mean also animals in the wild, uh, animals that you can't touch, um, animals that you have to look for, except maybe in the Galapagos, but that you're not, you're not in their space. It's not a, a zoo or a sanctuary or um, a petting zoo or whatever. It is you know, local communities or local operators that take you to areas where wildlife is wild, where nature is free. And you are going there and you are spending as much as possible of the money that you had budgeted for your trip 
in those areas with those people and making sure that that money goes into their hands. Um, I'd say one thing that I think none of our students ever forget and that I consider to be one of the most impactful experiences when I'm in the forest, and this is gonna sound really small, is buying a bar of chocolate from the Sunny Warmi, this woman's cooperative. Why? Because I'm literally looking at the cacao plant that they picked it from as I do this. And I know that they bought cacao from the neighboring farms so that they have some income to be able to buy their kids school uniforms and that they then process that cacao themselves and are selling it themselves. And I'm putting $5 into the hands of a woman who is then going to be able to use it for whatever she wants to use it for. Um, and for many women in the Sani Warmi or almost all the women in the Sani Warmi, it's the first salary or first income they've ever had personally in their lives. And they use it almost exclusively in their homes to take care of their children, to provide them with medicine or uniforms or whatever else they need. And until you have put money into the hands of someone who created and sold, and then is going to gain all the benefits from a product, it, it, it's very hard to understand what that feeling is like. But it's very hard to go back after that to feel this very separate feeling from buying a boxed product somewhere that you have no idea. We've, you know, we've totally separated ourselves from who makes our stuff and who gets the money and where that's going. And, and this is a totally different experience. And you have that opportunity when you're traveling to communities like this. And Sani is not the only community like this. There's hundreds of thousands of communities around the world who are doing similar projects. I could list probably like 20 right now if you ever wanted them. And if you go out of your way, it's not even that much more research, but just going out of your way to research organizations that are going to be indigenous owned or community owned uh, that are ideally if they have land that they are protecting as a part of it. Um, not only is it going to leave a positive impact, but I'm just going to pause it here that it's going to be a way cooler experience because you're going to go somewhere that very few people are going. You're going to have a true human connection, which also makes a huge difference. and you're gonna, you know, leave a positive impact. And a lot of these times you're gonna go to places where like five tourists have gone before. And that's so, so cool. Um, so yeah, I'd say just do a little bit more research or find an organization. I won't say necessarily, you know, my own obviously, but find an organization that you can trust to know that they care about this. Cause some of these lodges, they're so small that they're not gonna have their own website. Sunny Lodge does, but and you might need to use a platform to find them, but make sure it's a platform that's truly dedicated to their benefits. Before I switch over to the last few questions, I wanted to ask, I know you started your career in the rainforest. So what what was your experience living in the rainforest? And do you have tips for travelers coming to the rainforest? Um, to be fair, when you were answering that question just before, I was thinking I, that's exactly what I think. Um, especially the part about the connection. And I know that that sounds so cliche um, that oh, uh, disconnect to connect, you know, <laughs> but um, I truly, I think some of the, some of the deepest friendships that I have made uh, in, in my life have been in those situations where you really, you didn't have a phone or internet or a laptop to run behind and then kind of miss that moment um, and not only connections with other people but I think also with yourself I think being in those situations where you're in the field and you don't really have an escape from your own brain so it pushes you to really enjoy your own company I guess and I, I think that's um I wouldn't change that for anything but then again having said that I think that also comes with a challenge of you know um it gets sometimes uncomfortable and you know if you're a bit like me uh then you get homesick sometimes which can be hard but um all in all I would say it's it's a really cool experience and a tip that I would give uh, pack light <laughs> <laughs> because most likely in these places you realize you really don't need much you just need a couple of clothes that can dry easily and maybe some cards that's about it <laughs> yeah that's great advice and I think your first point is really good it's impossible to escape from yourself I always know when I arrive in the rainforest it's very hard to imagine how I'm going to spend 
an hour and a half each direction rowing almost every single day, like three, two or three hours rowing. What else can I do but just listen to my own brain? There's no phone to look at. There's no one to talk to up there. Um, and you, you know, it's very hard to imagine yourself spending an hour and a half commuting each direction without looking at your phone. But it, it happens when you're when you're out there. So that's amazing. Um, well, to come into our last few questions, I think we already talked a little bit actually about our favorite parts and challenges of working in the field. So I'll just skip forward to our next one, which is the coolest or craziest thing you've seen while working in the field. <laughs> that's a really hard question because I feel like every time you are, like every season you will see something super amazing that kind of blows your mind. So, but I think... I think if I have to choose, then I will go with my first expedition with Opwell, which was back in 2014. And I went to Madagascar um, and I did four weeks in the forest site and then two weeks in the in Nozi Bay, which was the marine site. And that's where I learned to dive. And everybody kept talking about the amazing sea turtles. And, you know, I was just so desperate to see these sea turtles. I had never seen one before. Um, and it was on our last dive and I was just so bummed that I still hadn't seen one and I was so desperate to see one. And then finally, I just turned around and there was, you know, a couple of meters away from me, there, there was this beautiful, just breathtaking sea turtle. And I wanted to scream to everyone to turn around and see it as well. But of course, when you're underwater, you can't really do that. And I think that was the first time where I was truly so close to like a wild animal um, that you don't really see in other circumstances. Like you don't really see sea turtles in a zoo or yeah. And I think that's also when I, you know, those moments they make you think this is, you know, I want everyone to be able to see this. I want my, you know, future generations to also be able to enjoy those breathtaking moments and so yeah I guess that would be a really big moment for me but I know you have maybe a bigger one as well so I want to hear about yours <laughs> yeah I was gonna say I've been waiting for the whole podcast to get to tell my jaguar story so yeah I, I mine is a very clear moment for me that's the craziest thing I've ever seen because I really wouldn't stop talking for about the rest of the afternoon about it. And I think everyone in camp and my guys want to kill me. So this was actually a very serendipitous moment because unfortunately, both of our mammal scientists had gotten sick. Uh, this is in 2019. And I had to take over the mammal survey. And as I said at the beginning, I'm not a, a scientist. I'm a social scientist. But, um, you know, I've been running up all seasons for several years. Have, the mammal survey is relatively rapid to learn. And I decided I was going to lead this mammal survey. Uh, we were doing tracking, we were checking the camera traps as well. Um, and so I went out with two guides who were willing to help. And we went out to uh, the, actually the trail that's the farthest from our camp um, and the closest to the lodge. So usually a trail that would have quite a lot of people on it and probably not as much wildlife, although we frequently see uh, primates there. and. We were walking and checking the GPS and um, we're close to the end of our transect. I had a very, very small group that week um, and we were close to the end of our transect. And I asked the students, you know, we have another 500 meters before we reach 2K and we, and we don't, we could turn around now, but if you guys want, we can reach the end. And they said, yeah, let's go to the end. We got to the end um, and one of my guides was learning to be an ornithology guide. So he was super passionate about birds and started to hear um, these gray winged trumpeters, which are these huge forest birds that make uh, a weird sound that's kind of like, like it's a very unmistakable sound. And he asked me if he could go try to see them. And they're extremely unusual to see. We frequently see them on the camera traps, but they're really skittish for obvious reasons. So we don't normally see them in person. Um, and I was, you know, taking the last GPS waypoint. So I said, yeah, go ahead. And he went around the corner and started. Uh, calling them with his mouth and calling them with his phone and seeing if they would come out of the bush because they were very close. And we were all being incredibly quiet. And when we finished taking the waypoint, he called us over to try to see these birds. And they're still, you know, they're making a huge amount of ruckus at this point. Like they're all fired up that they can hear him calling them in. And we're going, you know, down kind of a trail. The trail actually leads back to camp, but it's like 10 kilometers. We weren't going to take that trail. 
and we're walking down the trail as quietly as possible. Birds are making a ton of noise. We still can't see a single bird. They're all in the undergrowth. And all of a sudden my guide goes, hi, what? And I was like, yeah, yeah, right. Um, well, to give a little bit of context, the guides love to mess with us and will like at least 10 times a day tell me there's an anaconda on my boat. So I'm like, there's no way that there's a jaguar. And I kind of look up from having look, looking for these birds and yeah, there's a jaguar. Um, and it is walking towards us rapidly. And eventually, you know, my guide pulls me to the ground, all the students behind me go to the ground and this jaguar keeps walking and stops about 10 meters in front of us, maybe less in the sunlight, gorgeous, massive male jaguar. We actually were able to identify him afterwards. His name is Brutus. And he stared at us for a full minute. It probably, it felt like a full hour, but a full minute he stood there flicking his tail and he looked so confused. He must've been coming for those trumpeters and didn't hear us because they were making so much noise. And it was like, what? I thought I was gonna find some birds. Like, what are these? And the funny thing is, you know, we never, none of myself or any of the students ever felt in danger. You know, the, the Jaguar was not interested in us at all. First of all, we were a group of about 10 people. And, and second of all, that's not what they were going after. And he looked at us and flicked his tail and then just turned around and walked off into the woods um, and disappeared. And luckily, a couple of us got it on video. There's a very funny video of the teacher behind me, Tiggy, and I like turn around with just the biggest grin on my face. Um, and then talked about it for the whole rest of the day. Um, so that was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I'm not sure it'll get beat relatively soon. Although not working in the field, I did see like hundreds of whales once and that was absolutely amazing. That's one of those things I was like, I couldn't even believe how many whales there were, um, but I was not working that time. So I'm not sure that counts. Well, I wanna end this out on a positive note here. We just have a couple more minutes. So. I wanna ask you why you personally believe we should keep fighting to protect biodiversity and prevent climate change and really what gets you out of bed in the morning? I think those are two different questions because what gets me out of bed in the morning is the breakfast waiting for me. <laughs> um, but what keeps me going for in this field, I guess, it's, I usually ask, I, I've been asking this similar question to in my interviews for my thesis. Uh, so I have thought a lot about it. And I think I have more of an ecocentric worldview, which basically means that you give intrinsic value to nature, regardless of humans. And I really think that that's my case. But as much as it is the way that I see things, that, you know, everything should be preserved because it is valuable just because it is, not because of we, we need to use it or enjoy it or whatever. I do see that um, that's probably not a good enough argument to convince others. So um, I usually use other arguments for fighting the cause. <laughs> uh, but I think also it's important to mention the community. I think the community that is fighting for, you know, a more for normalizing sustainability and it being the, yeah, the norm rather than the exception. I think that community is growing and it's super supportive of each other and, you know, very passionate people. And I think that's also what keeps me going to be part of that group of people that are driving things forward. And what about you? What's what's your that's reason awesome. for waking up in the morning and so yeah I did think about that um I mean I am a huge you know fitness nerd and I what I love to wake up to is going for a run but I'd say really what keeps me going is to like why I personally believe in this is, is twofold one of them is very similar to your first answer and it, it is about the intrinsic beauty and wonder and magic of our world and I, you know, I'll defer to one of my heroes, uh, Chris Tompkins, who talks about this in her TED Talk, which we could link here. And she just talks about bringing beauty back as a value for our society, because nature is so awe-inspiring and beautiful. And, you know, it, it, doesn't need, it doesn't need justification, as you said. And so that's one of my big reasons is I just, I can't imagine a world without it because I, I find it to be so wonderful. And then the other one is, you know, it is economic. And I come from a background of, of economic development and of 
working in businesses and startups and investors and knowing that what I just said probably isn't a great argument, as you said, Gara, and that we are going to lose billions of dollars, trillions of dollars. We can't continue to build on a world that takes things and then just throws them away and just burns things and doesn't really think about what happens next. And it's not about, oh, it's a moral argument or it's bad or I'm judging anybody. It's that it quite literally cannot continue the way it is for that much longer um, without these big massive companies even that are making tons of money off of destroying the world, haha. Without them making a massive loss and becoming incredibly risky investments for investors. You know, I've done a lot of work in ESG and looking at uh, risk mitigation through you know social and environmental impact management. And that's a huge deal. You know, you've got massive investors like BlackRock now looking at all of their companies and ensuring they have environmental mitigation standards in place because they know that their businesses could be interrupted by increased hurricanes, droughts, uh, you know, rainstorms, whatever is happening through climate change. And that is going to create massive losses. So I don't love that argument, um, but I am convinced that there has to be a financial argument for this to be successful in the long term. And I think the financial argument is more than there. So for me, it's both. Um, and I work really hard at, at both. But I'll always, I'll always be willing to defer to the, the economic argument if it's necessary. I think you did a really good thing there because you, I think your first argument is more of the heart and then you have the head as well. And I think yeah. that's, that, that's the key. Yeah. So I agree with that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Gara. This is a really fun way to do the episode. I'm glad I had a chance to talk about Ecuador and Sani. Uh, and yeah, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thank you so much and talk to you soon. Thank you for tuning in to Opwall's Field Notes. We hope you enjoyed this special episode learning about conservation challenges in the Galapagos and the Ecuadorian Amazon with me and Gara. Please do be sure to subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts to stay up to date on new episodes about conservation and biodiversity hotspots around the world coming soon on Opwall's Field Notes.